then America won't be America anymore. And the story of the Muslim community here may very well be like that of the Muslim community in France or in Germany. And that would be devastating for the social fabric of our country. And I will leave it there, and I thank you. And I hope we don't have to have this discussion again in this way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zogby. Uh, I know we have a lot of questions. And before we get to the questions, uh, just a couple ground rules. First, make sure it's a question and not a speech. Um, if you want to make a speech, you can do your own panel. Um, and then. Um, for, out of respect for our friends from C-SPAN, they have a boom mic, um, so they're going to come around. I know you guys are kind of crammed in here, so they'll come around and make their best effort to get the mic above you so that you can have your question heard to the rest of the country. Let me start off with a quick question, and kind of picking up on what Dr. Zogby talked about. And I've been getting this question quite a bit, both from friends and um, in the media, and that is, post 9-11, we, we suffered this horrendous, tragic attack, but the country seemed to pull together. And while there were incidents of retaliation and uh, some incidents not only against Muslim Americans, but people perceived to be Muslim American, why is this coming up now, eight, nine years later? Why is there now a call to stop the construction of mosques across the country? There are over 2,000 plus mosques in the country. The population has grown. There's over six to eight million Muslims in the country. Why is this coming to a head now? Do you want to answer that, Jim, or Salam? Look, there is a... There is a general mood afoot in the country. It is part and parcel of the broader social unraveling, I think, that is taking place. Um, we had... We saw it begin last summer. Um, I think some of it has to do with the fact that we have elected an African-American president and some folks just can't ingest it. There's no question, I think, that the economic distress and the social dislocation that has occurred is part of it. Um, and I think at the same time that eight or nine years of um, disinformation has taken a toll. But if the, if the social conditions weren't there, if this unraveling wasn't there, uh, I don't think we'd see it uh, in, this, in exactly the same way. It is classic uh, xenophobic nativism. Uh, we've seen it, as speakers mentioned in our history before. I mean, we had the anti-Asian uh, backlash in the, in the early part of the last century. Um, shortly after world, between the two wars, we had the, um, uh, an, an anti-Southern European. I mean, Italians got lynched, and there was a, a push to deny immigration. Actually, our folks and most of the Southern Europeans were called trash and got zeroed out because they were anarchist, socialist, whatever threats to America. And so we, we had the same kind of thing. And then we had the anti-German uh, wave as well. So in periods of economic stress, this begins to happen. Uh, it has been fueled, I think, by, by bigotry and ignorance. But um, another factor is, is that the president himself is in a bind. I mean, it, George Bush was able to come and speak out. Uh, if Barack Obama comes and speaks out as forcefully, you've got 20% of the public thinks he's Muslim already and holds that against them. And so in some ways, he's in a bind. It puts the rest of the, the, the country in a bind in that where, where does leadership come from on this? Uh, and how can leadership speak forcefully about it? I think it's a terrible situation. And we do need uh, political leadership instead of fanning the flames, as some are doing. We need political leadership to do uh, uh, the right thing and, and put this out. Because as I said, I think that the, the very social fabric of the country is at stake here. Salam, do you want to add anything? Well, I, you know, I think I, I agree with everything uh, Jim Jim has said, and uh, I think we're at a crossroads in our society uh, in terms of what, how we define America. Is, is America an exclusive club, or are we going to live up to, the stand, to our values of pluralism? And when people start questioning the Christianity of our president, uh, I, I think that's a form of religious nationalism. I think they're using religion to say, even religion now, within America is part of an exclusive club. 
Uh, and so this exploitation of the truth that is used also for political purposes, since this is now an election year uh, coming up to the November elections. And the fact is Muslim Americans are the, the easiest targets. They're an easy punching bag uh, for this uh, because we don't have the reach. We don't have a lobby. We don't have uh, a PR um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, and so while we are responding to, to everything, the other side obviously has the microphone. It's the other side of extremists. And my mentor uh, always said something that is very telling for us as Muslims, for us as Americans, for us as people. He said, the world is not divided into Muslims, Christians, and Jews. The world is divided into stupid people and intelligent people. Well, on that note, who wants to be the first to ask an intelligent <laughs> question? <laughs> Raise your hand and we'll have the gentleman with the mic come over. It's right behind you, Mike Schwartz. Suhail, you and I have discussed this in the past, and that is that while we know that the great majority of Muslims embrace and, and endorse the founding principles of the United States and want to be good Americans. Unfortunately, there are people who, uh, who, uh, who don't, the Nidal Hassans of the world, and who profess to be acting in the name of Islam. And one of the difficulties, it seems to me, is there's no central authority, there's no central definition of what a good Muslim is. Is there any effort uh, to, within the Muslim American community to, uh, uh, to, to uphold uh, an America affirming Islam and, and reject and marginalize those people who want to kidnap Islam. Thanks, Mike. Professor? Uh, I, think this, uh, I think this call for a centralized uh, figure in American Islam to tell people what Islam is, what's right and wrong, is uh, misguided. Uh, we do not have a pope, and we're not going to elect one for the United States. Um, we believe in democracy. We believe in structures where people even within Islam and not just outside it would hold to different interpretations of Islam so long as they are consistent within, uh, with the basic principles of the Quran. What we really need is a council of scholars, not people who call themselves scholars, spe especially not patriarchal scholars. Um, People who really understand what Islamic law is about, have studied it, can, can think about it and write about it, who will come together and evaluate the various trends in the United States and uh, Muslim trends and comment uh, on them in writing. That's why I was calling for an education. Uh, I would like it, for example, uh, recently a lot of people came to me and said, uh, you know, what about this story of the stoning uh, in Afghanistan? You know, uh, isn't that applying Sharia law? And I thought, oh my God, if that was applying Sharia law. And so we sat at my organization, Karama, and we wrote a multi-page uh, analysis of that in which we showed that, first of all, it's not application of Sharia law, and second of all, that the people who committed that act are themselves punishable because they killed innocent victims. You know, nobody is talking about that. So what we really need is not central authority. I, as a woman who believes in democracy, will move away from central authority, but ask for order and ask for responsibility and for uh, legal authority in the sense of understanding the religion to educate Muslims as well as non-Muslims in the U.S. I'd like to just add to that. It's not just the issue of what scholars are saying, but it's also what people are doing on the ground. I think the, the strongest front line against any kind of alienation or isolation of young Muslim Americans, that the work is being done in mosques, in youth associations, in community centers. Uh, it's people that promote civic engagement. It's people who promote the principles of Islam. And for example, there is no stoning in the Quran. And yet that, that myth continues to be repeated uh, that we have to respond to, unfortunately, over and over again. I just want to say as far as Sharia, it's, it's the, as we said, the path to God and the principles of Sharia are mercy, justice, and human dignity. The goals of Sharia are five that are accepted by all the scholars with unanimity. They are the rights to life, free expression, faith, family, and property. So if there's any violation of those goals, then it is a violation of Sharia. So that common understanding among the common Muslim, 
with, is, is really the goal that our organization and other Muslim American organizations are pursuing. Jim? Can I just take another, um, another cut at that in a, in a different way? Um, I, the, I'm a Catholic. Um, all priests are not pedophiles. Um, I work with Italians. Um, they're not all tied in with the mob. Um, I'm married to an Irish woman. She doesn't drink. Um, the, the, I, I remember saying after the Christmas Day um, attempt to blow up that plane in Detroit that we learned from that that we didn't connect the dots in our intelligence community correctly. As dangerous as not correct connecting the dots is to wrongly connect dots and think you've come up with a picture. And I think one of the problems that we've got is that, as I said in, in my remarks, they conflated every single incident that has occurred and drawn a portrait of Islam. Um, I, I, some have chastised me for using the word bigotry. But, but let's understand what, what, what it is. I mean, bigotry is when you take the characteristics of a few and generalize them into the behavior or, or, or attribute that then to the whole. So this priest, that priest, that priest. Actually, unfortunately, the only stories we ever read about priests these days are that. But the, the Salam story of the good, hard-working Muslims all over. And yet, we know in our own heart of hearts and in our own experience that the problem is we don't know Muslims well enough yet. And so uh, Aziza's point that we need to have this intelligent conversation, we need more exposure, we need to know more about it, we need to retain what we know, um, and we need not to connect the dots in a way that is not warranted. And so I, I think that more than a religious authority, there's more experience and a change of heart. Uh, and, and that would, I think, be helpful in dealing with this problem more than if you had the, the, the Muslim Pope say, he is not a Muslim for what he did, you would still have people saying he's not authentic, he's not speaking for it, Nidal Hassan is. You know? And I think that that's the problem that we have to contend with. I remember speaking one time in New York at a, 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 the first anniversary of 9-11. Uh, Tom Brokaw invited me to come and speak in the round to families of survivors. And it was a very painful day for them and it was a difficult experience for me. First question was, why did they do it? What, 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 what justified it? I said, nothing justified it, period. Absolutely nothing justified it. Next question, wh why do you say nothing justified it and then say, but? I said, I didn't say, but. I, I said, nothing justified it. When are you people going to stop trying to find justification? Now, I understood their pain. I understood that their pain had temporarily closed their ears to listening. But the reality is, is that from the, the rest of America, we didn't have that direct pain, and yet too many still closed their ears and made the judgment that all Muslims thought this way or all Muslims thought that way or all Muslims are inclined to violence and that you need to have Muslims speak out. And yet when Salam's group spoke out and other groups spoke out and repeatedly spoke out, nobody heard them. So, uh, yeah, responsible Muslims. Yeah, uh, they, they, you know, we need a Thank mechanism you. by yeah. which they can be heard. Professor, you had a comment? I just wanted to point out that while we're having this wonderful discussion, we don't even know yet what is, or we don't agree, what is the definition of Sharia law. Keep that in the back of your <laughs> mind. Next question. In the front here. Yeah, hi. Um, what role do you think the press plays in showing the Muslims in a negative light versus the positive light that it's already in, um, in terms of stoking you know, prejudice and stereotype and Islamophobia. Um, I work in the Middle East peace movement with a group of Muslims, Arabs, Jews, Christians. And what I found out is there's interfaith, multicultural Middle East peace movements, not just in Northern Virginia and D.C. They're in every city across the country. They're in Israel and Palestine. They're in Jerusalem. No mention of these um, organizations in the national media. So the question is, why do you think that's so if it is so? And then how can we change that so? For example, I'm Jewish, but I'm not a billionaire. But if you look at the press, all, all Jewish people 
are, we're all rich. And this stereotyping goes on with African Americans, with, uh, with 